Welcome to the Gen Z Stoic Podcast, where every week we strive to lead younger generations on a path to virtue through the insight of Stoic teachings and personal stories from our lives as Gen Z Stoics. Welcome back to another episode of the Gen Z Stoic Podcast. I am your co-host, Matteo. And I am your co-host, Ren. And today, we are greatly happy to be joined by Victor Giusfredi. Victor is a serial entrepreneur and mindset coach who has turned his diverse, which is an understatement, life experience into meaningful lessons and stories for his followers, clients, and readers. Victor's background spans multiple certifications, businesses, inventions, and a really well-traveled life. Uh, Recently, Victor has released his new book, No Grail Without Dragons, A Man's Unconventional Path to Love, Purpose, and Peace, which we will discuss further today. Throughout his work, Victor sends a message that suffering is optional, which we absolutely love. And by discovering your inner power and changing your mindset, you can live your dreams and realize a life of fulfillment and purpose. So, Victor, thank you for coming today. We're very happy to have you on. Welcome to the Gen Z Stoic Podcast. It's such a pleasure to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. So that was kind of a really scaled out overview of your life and a lot of the experiences you've been through. So I think for our listeners, it's better to hear it from you, kind of your life journey and some of the lessons that you've learned along the way. Thanks. And, and it sounds fancy. That intro was really fancy. So thank you. But um, I, I'm just a regular everyday guy that had a, a little knack for exploration. And uh, that's taken me to found uh, those businesses. And um, I did mindset coaching for a little bit. But uh, my passion is really the pursuit of knowledge and trying to find the ingredients for a happy and fulfilling life, which is something that I think we all struggle with. My uh, my my journey started in Argentina. So I was born in Mendoza, which is a small province uh, known for Malbec wine. And from then on, I've moved about 50 times, uh, established a few businesses, been married and divorced twice by 36, and, uh, and pretty much dug throughout life just to find a life of purpose, something that pushed me to keep going and to to find a way um, to satisfy all of the, all of my inner desires in a way and to find that North Star that will guide me to do something for the rest of my life, if that makes sense. And throughout, throughout all of your experience, though, I'm sure there were a lot of relationships that you, you gained and a lot of relationships that you lost. These could be friendships. These could be romantical relationships. When it comes specifically to just love as a whole, what are your your personal experiences with love? And we can get into this, you know, and relate this back to Stoicism as Stoicism is a philosophy that is actually deeply rooted in love and kindness. But when right. it comes to your personal experiences, what, um, you know, what can you share? Uh, good question. And it's true that the Stoicism is founded in love, uh, especially the love for knowledge, right? Because at the end, philosophy means that, means philo, excuse me, means knowledge. And Sophia means love, to love, right? And Ironically, it is the pursuit of love that put me on all these paths because at an early age, and I cannot explain why, I've always had this desire to find my soulmate or somebody who will love me and and and, and be my, my twin flame, per se. And that's what led me into all of these different routes of redefining and redesigning myself because... As I continued to fail in love, I found something new that I could use in the next relationship. And just that pursuit of a sustainable and fulfilling relationship is pretty much been my inner drive. And it's funny enough, I've never been asked this question before. And, and it's the first time that I'm saying this, but that that's what it's been. That's that's what's driven me the whole time. It's always been finding that that partner that you can spend the rest of your life with and uh, just know that they have your back and vice versa, you know, no matter what happens. Sometimes when it comes to relationships, it's you and your partner against the world that you be. So uh, when it comes to relationship experiences, well, I've had a lot because I've dated well over 100 women around the world. So from all ethnic backgrounds, um, I've been married and divorced twice by 36. And definitely, definitely I learned a couple of lessons along the way. I, I like the term where you said you were redesigning yourself within after each relationship. And I think that's something that's very important is people, especially when you're, you're a teenager, you're our age, go into relationships, maybe not knowing much about themselves. And that's kind of like the goal of the relationship is not building up themselves throughout the relationship, but discovering who they are and discovering, you know, really what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. And I think 
an aspect of that is maybe not knowing your weaknesses as much, especially as a younger individual. Um, both me and Mateo have not so fun experiences dating and we're only 18, <laughs> but there's certainly that aspect there. And so I, I wonder how important it is in terms of introspection. Have you realized that that introspection factor is to relationships? Well, that, oh my goodness, that hits the nail on the head because a while ago, I wondered, see, so now I, I, so I've been divorced twice and I've been a single dad and I'm 40. So by, by all standards, I'm almost undateable, right? If you hear that and if you see that in a profile, you're like, man, I want nothing to do with this guy. And it's not a profile. Uh, but yet now I'm engaged and I'm about to get married again. And we've been together for almost five years and it's, it's the perfect relationship, but that wouldn't have been possible without self interest without self awareness and introspection and this is why it's so important i i thought to myself if i were to create a dating profile what what qualities do i want in a partner and it was a tough question because when i was 18 years old i said well i wanted to be hot for sure and i wanted to be fun and i wanted to be into the things that i'm into and and come and cheer me on when I'm racing my bike down the hill or, you know, I'll be my groupie when I'm playing guitar. And then when I had that, I was like, wait a minute, that's, that's, that was, um, that was, I was wrong. And, and you start, you start finding out more and more about what it is that you want and that you like. But, but here's the thing. What I didn't know is that we think that we have weaknesses, right? You, you mentioned weaknesses and, and I don't see them as weaknesses. I see them as things that you don't know that hurt you. And the thing with relationships, it's almost like going into the forest. You can go into the forest on your own. And maybe the first time you went to the Appalachian Trail and you go on flip-flops and shorts and you just bring a bottle of Gatorade. And six hours into your journey, you find out that you've been bitten by mosquitoes, snakes, and you run out of water. And now you have to go back and you feel defeated. You feel dumb because, you know, man, how, how come I didn't think of this? But you didn't know. And, but, but, and, and that's preventable. If you look at a at a tour guide and say, hey, what should I do if I go into the Appalachian Trail, right? But when it comes to relationships, not a lot of people share their failures or, or tell you in a mile from now, there's an oasis and you can have some water. And the things that hurt us the most are the things that we don't know, the things that we expect. And most importantly, the behaviors or, or the responses to certain things that we're not aware of. I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but... Something happens, an event, and then you react in a way that you later regret. And you don't like that person. You don't like yelling at your partner. You don't like saying something mean. Um, maybe you don't like flirting with another girl when you're in a committed relationship. And that in psychology is called, um, or at least in Jungian psychology, is called uh, the shadow, which is this other part of you that is almost like, like an automated response to certain events. And those are the snakes or those are the things that we start to find out about ourselves when when we go into relationships because you know what your good qualities are because you you probably embody them 80 percent of the time uh, you know that you're giving you know that you're loyal you know that you're honest but what about the parts that you don't know or the parts that haven't that you haven't come to to realize or find out about yet right maybe in my case I realized that I was a really angry person when when I felt threatened or I or I went into an argument. I realized that I either stonewalled and I didn't talk to her and and, and I just said, you know what, this will blow over, or I'll just snap and and leave the place. And then no wonder girls left me, right? <laughs> so I mean, why wouldn't you leave somebody who's such a dick? And so and so when it comes to relationships, I think that. Those parts of ourselves are the ones that contribute to the failure, if you will, and, and realizing those things about you. And, and that's why you do better the next time. So when it comes to introspection and self-awareness, it's crucial because you can make any relationship work as long as both people want to be in it and, and they understand the value of our relationship and, and understand that it's likely the only game that you can really win because both parties are making the the rules as you go, right? If you're, if you're into the financial game, you're one party and the other party is the market. If you're into trying to climb the, I don't know, the hierarchical ladder at your job, well, one part is you and the other part is your job. And you can't control what your job does or their responses or how they're going to uh, 
react to certain situation, but with your partner, you can, you can say, Hey, let's come to this agreement. Let's come to this term. And you can build that emotional home that you want, but you can't do that without self-awareness because being divorced twice, both of the times I've been into irre irreconcilable differences, which means that you cannot see eye to eye. And it's sad because you're destroying a life. You're destroying all of this future that you built in your head, all of these, these plans that you had. And you have to start from scratch just because you cannot see eye to eye with somebody else. And without self-awareness, it, it, you're, you're, you're likely to lose. You're definitely likely to lose. So I think it's, it's an axiom. Self-awareness is number one. Well, it's interesting that you, that you said, you know, starting from scratch, right? So I have two, I guess, two sort of things. One, when you are in a relationship and it may not work out, it, do you believe, one, that it's not necessarily fully starting all the way from the beginning? You still gain all the lessons from the past, but now you just have sort of a new slate, but you can take everything that you learned. And then this is sort of a, a, a more broad, larger question. But when, I mean, dating has changed drastically in the past, you know, 10, 20 years. And because of, you know, all these social media dating apps or just the ability to connect with more people a lot quicker. So... I feel like, and I ask you this because you've probably seen both ends of the spectrum. You've probably seen, you know, the beginning, you know, where it's not so much connected on social media as much. And now like dating, you know, Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, all these, all these apps and Snapchat and Instagram and all these ways to, to meet people online that didn't exist before. How has that changed your perspective on dating? Like as you sort of seen these apps grow and these social media companies grow as well? Um. Well, it, I think it's a benefit and a curse at the same time, almost, almost like a double-edged sword. Because on one hand, when so when I started dating, um, social media wasn't out there yet. I think MySpace was the first thing, and that was a few years into dating. I'm, I'm, I think when I went into MySpace, I must have been 21, 20, yeah, but not 20, yeah, about 20, 21. And, um, and the thing is that on one hand, it gives you a glimpse of someone who you might consider to be a romantic interest. But when it comes to relationships, inevitably, unless you are planning on having a platonic relationship through pictures and text messages only, and that's what you want, well, that's perfect. But I think reality is a little different where we actually want to be with someone physically. And not only you want to be with someone physically, but you also want to be with someone physically and make it work in the way that it's pleasant, that it's what you think it's going to be and what the other person thinks it's going to be too, right? And have this, this emotional home where you feel that you both belong to each other, you're both committed, and then you're going through life together. And you can't do that on an app. On an app, you might, again, you might, you might satisfy some of, um, some of your requirements, you know, how you think that your ideal partner should look like based on whatever preferences you have. Uh, what interests should she have? Well, you know, in there you can sort of see at, at first glance and that allows a, a basic level of connection that you might not have with someone who you might consider interesting at a coffee shop because that will take a different approach. You know, they're, they're not burying their profile in their face. So you're like, oh, she's 27. She lives in, in you know, in my town and she likes rock and roll. And so great. Okay, she, she might be a good match, right? Um, so, so it, it serves two purposes. Yeah. It allows you to connect with more people, but it leads you into this illusion that you have to find the person with the perfect specifications. And if it doesn't work, it also gives you the illusion that, well, just swipe right, you know, next doesn't matter. And, and that's not what relationships are because you cannot have a friendship. You guys probably wouldn't have a friendship if you didn't have agreements, if you didn't have disagreements and found a way for both of you to meet in the middle and say, hey, this is beneficial for both of us. And that's what a relationship is. And and what the difference that besides your best friend, you also have a romantic relationship with this person, right? You satisfy a different level of connection, which is the, the physical, the intimate relationship. Um, so I think it works both ways. It's cool to meet people and to connect with someone. And sure, you can when after my first divorce i i used dating apps to start sort of to get my head out there and and, and another thing is that it, while i was because i got married at 22 so i was really young 
and and the whole time was like, oh, I should never gotten married. Oh, this girl likes me. Oh, what about this girl that shows interest in me? And I, my head was all over the place. But just because I was a young kid, it, it, it didn't mean anything else. And when I got divorced, I said, well, I'm going to try everything. And I just went on a dating rampage and I used dating apps. And the thing that I that I realized quickly is that it was just flop after another flop after another flop. And next thing I knew, I was really tired. I, I spent a ton of money going out with different girls every week. I had to put on a facade every time. Um, almost like you're always starting a new job every day. And then you go to this new job and then you're sort of in, in your own shell and you're trying not to step outside of the comfort zone, but also try to see what it is in there for you. And 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 at the end of the day, you don't invest enough time with anybody to get to know them and probably increasing your chances of failing. Yeah, I, th- I think my kind of gripe if I had to pick just one with these dating apps is the fact that it's reduced ga- dating to almost a game-like state. Like you mentioned with the swiping and then the facade, it's almost like a game where you're trying to match like, here's my mental picture of my perfect partner check off, check off, check off, check off. Oh, they don't check one box. Got to go. And that's, I think that's really kind of a reductionist way to look at dating. And it's something that I think has become really pervasive in our generation, just because of the fact that that's what we've grown up with. And it leads to, I think, you know, obviously we shouldn't base our judgments off of what we see in high school and college, because those, especially in America are not the relationships that are going to last, but those relationships are really bred in toxicity because of that fact that there's nothing besides surface level qualities. And that I think just inherently has decreased the value of dating in today's age. And so I, I think that that's a good point to be made, but for people who, you know, are, are maybe our age and don't have a reality outside of maybe meeting people outside of social media, like that's, that's a part of life that we're just going to have to deal with and accept. What are some tips for success then? Um, and overcoming all of these negative things we talk about so that you maybe can build a better relationship off of these social media apps. Obviously, there's going to be a physical component of that meeting in person, but some tips just to start out with these apps. Yeah, you know, the physical is just inevitable. If if you're looking to fulfill this innate need that we have to find one partner and then spend the rest of our lives with them, which is, it seems to be the way that we are designed. You know, some animals have, uh, they they procreate and then they leave the nest and some uh some like they i think i think it's the condor when their partner dies the condor goes to the highest point and then just plunges and dies and and so we are sort of wired in the sense that we we do need someone next to us i i also went through the stage of saying i don't need anybody i'm going to be alone you know i'm just going to satisfy my my primal needs when i need to and then i'm not going to get tangled into any drama but it doesn't work because eventually Happiness is not real if it's not shared. And we are creatures of connection. So you do have to connect with this person. But if you're starting with with social media and dating apps, then you have to, or, or at least I will have to understand what it is that I find valuable. What is it that that I seek in a different person, right? And Something I learned from from Tony Robbins, which changed my life because it explained the reason why I had had so many partners and I had failed. And it's that we are all driven by six core driving needs. One of them is significance. So some of us need to feel that we're important to the other person, that we they can live without us and, and that we play a big role in their happiness, uh, which was my, my issue. I, I always bent over backwards for other people and then when they didn't either reciprocate it or at least gave me a good job i went into my mode of saying man i'm I'm done i don't i don't want anything to do with this anymore because i'm not being appreciated right so that was see that was that was my own pitfall other people like connection they like to connect in a different way they like deeper connections lighter connections some like uh, um, some like variety for example they're the, the ones that always want something new, something thrilling, something fresh. Uh, and then you have the people that like contribution or growth and um, and understanding which driving, we all experience all of the needs at the same time, but understanding which one is your primordial one, which one is the one that pushes you most, it's a good place to start. Because if I seek significance and I and I want a partner, and, and that's a need that you have, so 
So you need to feel that you are significant to someone. You know, and, and that stems from a lot of other issues and a lot of other experiences from childhood and whatnot. But if I know that for a fact, I need to feel important in someone's life, then at least you can communicate that to your partner and say, hey, this is this is what keeps me up. Like this is what this is what makes me be a better person. When when I just I don't know, set the bed and you come and say, thanks so much for setting the bed or thanks so much for doing the dishes or Oh, you're so important in my life. And and that's a need that you need, that you need to, first of all, accept that you have and then that your partner has to fulfill for you. you sure, you can do it yourself. And that ties back to stoicism because ultimately you can become the rock on which you stand by giving yourself what you want. But when it comes to relationships, it's a game of two. And what if your partner seeks variety, Right. If you fall into a rut of having the same routine over and over and you have a monotonous relationship, next thing you know, your partner cheated on you with someone and you don't understand why. You were the perfect partner. You did everything okay. But then she still went on and, and did something with someone else. And the thing to understand is that we are we break our own code when it comes to fulfilling these needs. And and that's something that you cannot see in social media and or, or, or social or, or online dating. But if you know what it is, then you can search for a partner who actually likes that. Maybe, maybe, maybe a, 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 the girl grew in a household where she was taught to give significance to the men, and and there you have it. You know, you know what you need. You can spot someone who who can give it to you, and then if she knows what she needs, and you can give it to her, then that's a good match. That those are your chances of actually success, uh, much more so than having things in common or activities in common or the way that you look, because I don't look the same now that I looked at 18. I think I look better, but, but, uh, but, but the truth is our, our looks decay over time and that eventually that's gone. And, and now what is it that you have to offer, right? What, what is it that keeps, what's the glue that keeps you together with your partner? And, and that glue is it, it's that need. It's the need that you that you have that you need to fulfill within yourself. So you, you brought it back to stoicism, and I'm going to build off of what you said. The interesting thing about love and stoicism is love is shameless. Love is the one sort of feeling that you can have that is there is no you know shame in feeling too much of it. You can never love somebody too much. Now, there, there is right. a difference between loving somebody and lusting over somebody, right? But when it comes to actual love, and relationships. And like you said, we, we sort of value now sort of the wrong things. I mean, you could value, like you said, variety, you could value, you know, the way someone looks or the way someone dresses. And it's really these superficial components to a relationship that don't really provide value, you know, to your soul and to your fulfillment. So stoically speaking, what does, and I know it's going to vary from person to person, but if you could make sort of a generalization, stoically, what a fulfilling relationship is rooted in and just like a couple key components that are like non-negotiables basically. Interesting. Um, so I think that a fulfilling relationship for me happened when I never, I never thought about the, about it the way that you just said love is shameless because it's when I lost my own shame of loving that I started to become the partner that I wish I will find. Why? Because I started fighting my ego in many ways. Uh, if my partner raised their voice at me, <clears throat> I no longer thought about, wow, she's nagging. I cannot put up with this. I don't need this. I make enough money not to, not to have to tolerate it. I didn't. I Instead, I took a more humane approach and a, and a loving approach. And I said, well, if she's not acting right, it's because She's not feeling right. So how can I make it better? And I lost that shame of being vulnerable, of being of service, of being of putting myself second uh, or even humiliating myself, as, as I will consider it back then, in benefit of my partner's emotional state. And it was it was at that point that I started to realize that ego is the enemy, right? Ego is that 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 voice in your head that that tells you, man, screw this girl. She's not worth it. You know, oh, you shouldn't be treated like this. Or it that that voice. You you have to understand that if if it's love that you pursue, you cannot achieve love until 
you're able to withhold the golden rule. You, you, you do for your partner what you want done for you. Even if it's not reciprocating, even if your partner doesn't give back to you, right? If it, and, and many times that's the case. And it's the case both ways because there's no way that your partner can know what you want all the time and give it to you and vice versa. You can do your best. But so fulfilling is it's just changing the quality of your thoughts, changing the way that you perceive the relationship, changing who you perceive your partner to be because she's also with you despite the many things that she doesn't like or the many reactions that you have and she probably doesn't approve of because of the way that she feels. Um, and so when, when, it be, when it starts to become fulfilling, it's when you say, well, man, I'm so thankful that I have someone who backs me up. I'm thankful for someone who spent all these years with me, despite me getting older, despite me, for example, having kids. So some woman would not consider dating someone with kids, but, and it's not a negative, but you have to, you have to be appreciative for the things that you have. And that's when you begin to find fulfillment. You, you, you begin to grow, you begin to contribute in the relationship and sure you have some setbacks, but as long as you keep your 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 eyes on the price and saying, "Hey, I already got what I want. How do I make it better? Right? How do I how do I progress in this? How do I, and and what does making it better mean? It it means how do you feel in the relationship? Because ultimately, everything we do is because of a feeling, because of something that 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 we feel inside. You know, you might quit jobs because at some point you feel like you're outgrowing your emotional skin and you need to do something else. Um, you might break a relationship because you just don't like the way that you feel. Maybe you feel trapped emotionally and it's, and it's always emotionally, you know, it's not, nobody's holding a gun to your head or, or hopefully not right. Or, or tying you in a corner and keeping you prisoner and saying, you know, you're only going to do what I say. It's, it's always invisible. It's always this, this, this invisible field of, of emotions that pushes to do things in the physical realm. So to answer your question, Mateo, um, you start having a fulfilling relationship when you start recognizing the many good things that you have in it, and you can see eye to eye to iron out the rest of the ones that you don't think are are so cool. That's that's a beautiful way to put it. I think that we kind of lose sight of gratitude within relationships because of how much hard work is required to get to a healthy place. People, I think, have this preconceived notion that. Uh, you were talking about soulmates. You meet your soulmate, uh, it goes swimmingly, you guys get along great, and you're always going to conquer these issues together, no disagreements, and it's because it's your soulmate, right? It's it's just going to be this easy thing that you're going to be happy for the rest of your life with. And even if you do meet your you know soulmate, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. Even if it's the person who has those perfect traits that you look for and you mesh really well, there, it, it's human nature to be in disagreement. And so I really love that you brought up that gratitude aspect. And there's something that's kind of been, I guess, inherent in all of your answers. And that's that kind of dichotomy of control that Epictetus expresses where we worry so much about controlling what our partner feels like, what they do, and worrying about how, how we can change that instead of just asking them why it is, and then adjusting ourselves so that we can provide them a better environment. And it's something that's inherent, I think, in all of your answers is that the, the the stresses we have and the, the kind of pitfalls we see are because we are too controlling. And we're, we're saying, hey, this person is treating me in a negative way. Like, what did I do? Everything is about me versus maybe, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with me. So why don't I just ask? And that is something that I think is very inherent. So I, I was just curious if you kind of read about the dichotomy of control and if that's something that kind of you see within relationships being a successful tool to be used. Yeah, it's, I know. I have not read specifically about the dichotomy of control, but the dichotomy of control, it's something that that reflects in our everyday doing. And, that, and, 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 and funny enough, it goes in all relations and in, in all philosophies and, and religions, right? And even stories, we, we think that we want to achieve a particular emotional state and we think that we want to avoid a particular emotional state, those being either suffering or joy. If if you boil down your, your existence to two things, you're either in two states, either you're suffering or you're enjoying. There's no in between, right? And uh and a trick that I learned, it's <laughs> so so in, in feudal Japan, for the people who were interested in becoming samurais, they they went to a to a samurai school and they saw the, the master and they say, Hey, you know, I'm interested in learning the art of the sword. 
So the master said, great. So normally a master will have the, the person start with little things like chores, cleaning around the, the dojo, taking the garbage out, whatever. And <laughs> throughout the day and throughout this, this new student performing this mundane task, the master will come from behind them and hit him with a bamboo, with a bamboo sword in the head. I mean, as hard as he came. Like, and, and the student will be like, what the hell? And, and this will happen over and over and over. The, the, the master will show up out of nowhere and just smack the guy in the head. So what does the student do? He says, okay, I'm not going to let the master catch me by surprise anymore. So what does he do? He starts, he's, he's mopping the floor, but he's looking into the corners like, okay, can he come from that angle? Can come from behind the door. And and the master always came from he, where he least expected and smacked him anyways. And this happened long enough until the student completely gave up. He said, you know, I'm going to get smacked anyways. I, I'm, I'm stressing myself out trying to figure out where this guy is going to come from. I'm not performing my duties the best that I can because I'm always worried about him hitting me and me blocking it. So I just give up. So So I just, you know what, if he comes... He'll smack me and it'll be a one thing and I'll just keep going with my day. And once that student comprehended that, then the master said, great, now you're ready to start learning. Because when samurai start fighting, if you get too caught up into what your opponent is going to do next, you cannot see this guy coming here. And and that's why you have to have this, this wide range of view and always be ready and nimble on your feet for everything. So then you can actually react without having to think about it. And when it comes to relationships, that's pretty much the dichotomy of control. You're always trying to, you know, you got hurt in the past. And, and so now you're trying to see where the next pain is going to come from. And you're also causing yourself stress and pain. And a trick that I learned is something that goes back to what you said, Ren. I ask, I, instead of trying to guess, instead of trying to figure out what it is that is going to happen, I, I, I say, hey, sweetheart. From one to ten this week, how good of a partner have I been? And she will give me an answer, anywhere from one to ten. And then I'll ask, what could, it, what could I do to make it a ten? And that's how you start learning about your partnering and about the things that you do and about how your actions contribute to the results that you either want or don't want and the things that you think. Because then you're thinking, like, huh, so I did that thinking that I was doing something good and that generated a negative emotional state in my partner, right? And so you start asking these questions and you start getting clarity from your partner. And all of a sudden you actually are establishing a relationship. You're, you're giving your partner a voice to tell you, yeah, this is, this shook me up this week, or this was amazing. And, you know, as a human being, you're going to do less of one thing and more of the other. Imagine if your partner asked you and say, Hey, Ren, one to 10, how, how good have I been this week? Having that voice to say, you know, you've been an A because this and this and this kind of shook me up a bit, but the rest of the week you've been amazing. And, 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 and that gives you an opportunity for you to grow safely, like martial arts, right? You, you, in martial arts, you, push your, you put yourself to the point of pain, but you don't hurt each other so you can get stronger and then come back and learn new things instead of the typical, you know, you do this and I do that. And then you hit each other really low. And next thing you know, you hate each other and that's it. It's over. Yeah, I, I could personally say if my partner said that to me, I would be shocked. That's, that's something <laughs> me that, too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it highlights there's kind of two sides of the coin when it comes to relationships, and it's openness and then closing yourself off. And I think we talked about very early on in this episode about like weaknesses and the parts of yourself that you maybe don't like as much. And there's certainly in relationships, you face the choice of are you going to be open in those struggles? Are you going to share them so that you can grow? Are you going to close yourself off and say, they're just going to accept me for who I am and I don't really have to grow. And I think that's something that directly opposes if you're going to live even just a philosophical life within your relationships, it should always be about growth. And I think that openness, whether it is, you know, you're asking your partner, how did I do this week from one to 10, or it's a specific struggle you're dealing with. And you, you say, how was I in this arena of my life this week? I think any tip that you can give in terms of being more open, you can't go wrong with that. Now, obviously, you know, if you're doing really bad things, don't be open or don't be very crass about being open. But I think your, your advice lends itself to the fact that when we're faced with that, those two sides of the coin, 99% of the time, openness is the successful strategy when it comes to relationships. And it sounds like something that you've kind of learned and realized. So if you could speak a little bit more about that kind of openness 
I know you gave that tip, but just speak about it a little bit more because I love hearing about that. Thanks. And, and yeah, I, I learned I learned just by actually testing all of the other approaches because I have been a very closed off person. I mean, it, it will take you a while to get to know me. I wouldn't I wouldn't be vulnerable. I wouldn't tell you about my my struggles or my fears or what I needed because it wasn't manly or it wasn't whatever. Right. And um, but but what, what you said, you know, when let's say you do something wrong. And, and you don't want to be open about what you did wrong. Well, that's also part of you. And that's also part of being open because, well, number one, when you own up to your mistakes, it's hard. When you go and say, hey, sweetheart, I don't know, I did X and X thing, right? That you know that if, you know you did something wrong because you know that if you fess up to it, you're probably going to get a result that you don't want. So that first of all, it comes self-control, which is, completely tied up to stoicism because you have to have the 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 will to say man i'm in this relationship for three years sure we're going through a rough path somebody comes up to me and says hey hey man and you want to get it on you know nobody's gonna find out and and you're like oh and, and now your animal instinct kicks in and you have to have that self-discipline to say no no i'm cool because the other part is well if you call yourself a man and, and you do want to do the right thing and have that peace within yourself, which I think is the ultimate treasure, then you're, you're either going to have to reject the advance or fess up about it because otherwise that's going to grow within you. And it doesn't matter whether the person you're with beats you or not, that's something that you're going to carry within yourself. And it's, that's a negative stain on your own perception of yourself. So by being completely open, you are ensuring yourself that you actually don't hurt your own being per se you you don't carry any of those negative things that you think are bad within you which which, which also helps with a one to ten approach because when you yell at a partner let, let's say you're you're an angry person and you yell at them and you find a thousand justifications of why it was right it was it, you know what she deserved it she cursed at me whatever it is and then you break off the relationship that's going to be your regret that's gonna that's gonna be your pain. That right there is why breakups are hard because when you break up with someone, you realize all of the things that you could have done right, but you didn't do so willingly because you knew at the point in time that you shouldn't have done that, right? And so being open and vulnerable, it's saying, Hey, I'm sorry, I messed up, I didn't mean to, you're not any of the things that I call you. And, and, and let's move on. And so you sort of, you know, you, you sort of heal the wound. It's never the same, but at least you heal it and you grow. And, and that's part of building a real relationship because you both are human. You both are going to make mistakes and giving yourself that grace, giving yourself that, that, that understanding and say, Hey, I, I make mistakes, but I will learn from them. Yes, I did this. I won't do it again for multiple reasons. One, because if I promise to take care of you and I promise to protect your heart, per se, or, or, or in other words, not put you in an emotional state that you don't want to be, whether that is feeling insignificant or feeling disconnected or feeling bored or whatever it is, I won't do it again. And that gives your partner more solid footing to be like, oh my goodness, I can live without this guy. You know, he is the one and, and vice versa, right? But I can only talk from, from the male point of view. And that's what I learned about being open is that is that it's almost like an insurance policy for you to always keep on the right track and do right within yourself. Because here's the other thing. I overcame the fear. I, I had this, um, um, not unfounded, but just uncontrollable fear, uh, fear of abandonment. I, I will do whatever it took to not be cheated on, left, you know, dumped, whatever you want to call it. And the one thing that I realized is that the only way that I could overcome that, and, and, and I realized this after the fact, is just by doing my mere, my, my best every single time. Because then you, you're you sort of surrendering to the universe, per se, and say, hey, I, I gave this my very best. I was honest. I was, I was straight. I told her my needs. I, I did what I, what I said I was going to do. I feel great with myself. And if it didn't work out, and she left for someone else or whatever, you know what? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Because then you're okay. Then, then breaking up is not an issue. And, um, and so I think that being open is, is really a, a core axiom of having a successful relationship. You're just holding your cards close to your chest doesn't help anyone. After all, you're trying to 
to spend your life with a person and, and eventually all secrets come out. So you might as well just not try to hold them willingly. Well, I appreciate the, the point that you made about, you know, you can apologize, right? And you can, you can first admit your wrongs, right? That, that takes a lot of fighting the ego, right? To come forward and say, look, I messed up. I did this wrong. That I'm not going to lie. That sucks. I hate putting myself in a position where I'm like, look, I messed up because I don't ever like to be wrong. Right. And neither, none of us do. But there's a quote from Epictetus, which sort of emphasize, and it's not specifically on relationships, but you could relate it to aligning your actions with your values in love. And he says, first say to yourself what you would be and then do what you have to do. So if you make a mistake, and then you fess up and you're like, look, like I know you can, it's actually, if you get into the habit of doing that, it's very easy to not follow up with action because you, you tell yourself, you know, oh, I can just come forward and say, I'm sorry every time and they're going to forgive me. And you were talking about action and actually changing and learning from your mistakes. So I think emphasizing the point that, you know, an apology and confessing for where you messed up means absolutely nothing if it's not followed up by action. The second point that you made that sort of stood out to me was getting angry and yelling. And Seneca says, anger, if not restrained, is frequently more destructive than the injury that provoked it. Now, this is interesting. And we see in the world today, we, we are seeing rising rates of domestic violence in households, especially within relationships. And you could argue, you know, very logically that this is because there's a lack of practicing stoics in the world. We allow our initial emotion and our initial emotional response to dictate our next action. So if you could touch on what it means to really control the anger, one, touching on the very negative effects that being a very angry person and allowing those impulses to dictate your actions in relationship has. And then once you sort of change and allow, you know, your mind to think first rather than your emotion how that can benefit your relationship further. Yeah. Um, so to, to, to close off the apology part, you're right. When there are people, and I've definitely been with someone who constantly messes up and then they apologize for it. But what happens is that when you spend enough time with that person, um, that wears off in the sense that you go back to a negative emotional state. And it's inevitable. And, and, and either the relationship ends because at some point, whether it's six months from now, one year, 10 years, 50 years from now, you'll say, hey, you've been doing this the whole relationship and you keep apologizing for it. Apologizes are not enough. You have to, you have to change your actions. So the, the core of an apology is to understand why it is you're saying you're sorry, right? You understand that you hurt the other person in some way. And how did you hurt them? You took them by surprise by making them feel something that you either promised not to make them feel or that you didn't intend to make them feel. And we do that all the time. You know, I, I said something to my fiance yesterday and I didn't mean to say it. And I, but right, right away, I caught myself and I says, baby, sorry. You know, that I didn't mean it to say it that way. This is what I meant, and I hope you know that. And she said, no, no, I know. So, 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 so it, it happens, right? But you have to understand why, and you also have to understand that you don't have to do it again because if you truly value that person, if you really think that this person um, is as valuable as you are, then it is in your best interest not to do it because if you have a job that you like, you're not going to curse, curse out your boss every time because you're going to get fired. And if you go on the street, you might you might get away with doing something to someone twice, three times and apologize. And the fourth time, they're going to beat you or, or they're going to call the cops on you. You know, I, unfortunately, relationships are that place where you get away with so many things that you will not get away anywhere else in the world. And and, and that's when you have to start pulling back and realize, and well, I have to take a look at my relationship the same way that I take a look at everything else. If If I eat a bunch of garbage this week, well, I'm sorry, Victor, you know, yes, I'm not going to do it again. But then you do it again next week and you do it again next week. And then you get diabetes and you're obese and now you hate yourself and you're into that. Hell. And, and so in relationships is pretty much the same. It's, it, it requires the same level of responsibility. Um, and anger goes right hand to hand with that because first you have to understand where your anger comes from. And anger, as I came to understand it in my case, uh, 
I, I, I consider myself very level headed until I snapped. And it was something that I was proud of. You know, well, uh, you can tell me whatever, it doesn't matter. But I, one second I went from zero to berserk. And, and I will always regret it. I, I will always regret it for multiple reasons. Number one, the way I felt with myself, because when you replay that scenario in your head and you see who you became in that point of time, man, nobody wants to be around you, not even yourself. And, and here you have a partner who you're trying to build love with, because that's probably the only reason why you're with this person, because you want to feel the, 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 the emotion of love for as long and as often as you can, and you're hurting your own outcome. But, but in my case, it stemmed from being an outlet to exigent circumstances. When I felt that I was facing the emotional state that I wanted to avoid, whether it was abandonment or uh, the fact that we couldn't see eye to eye and I knew that that would lead to a breakup, that triggered my anger. And, and it's almost like you're trying to slap someone into reality uh, instead of reeling them in or trying to make them understand. But anger is it's, it's, it's so, so hurtful. I, I think that, you know, you mentioned a bunch of accomplishments of mine in, in the beginning, which to me don't mean much, but something that I'm really not proud, but I'm, I'm really glad I got a hold of is it's overcoming my anger over uh, understanding when it starts showing up, why it is that it's showing up and how to talk to myself in a way that I have to remind myself not to get to that point and where all of that leads. And that took a lot, a lot, a lot of failure, especially in relationships. And because like I said, in, in society, it's easy to, to behave yourself because you know that if you do something two or three times, there will be a, an immediate consequence and something you don't like. But in relationships, we allow ourselves to get even further and sometimes things get even worse. And, and anger is a real big enemy. I think, I think of everything. There's, there's, there's never been uh, a case where anger has served me, even if it's been a life, uh, a life or death cir uh, circumstance, which I have been to. Um, anger has never really yelled any positive results other than the, the, the only result is just the self-loathing of losing control of oneself. And then that person that you don't really like to see when, when that happens. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a quote I like from Carl Jung, who, where he says that everything that irritates us about others can lead us to an understanding of ourselves. And I think that uh, it's something that we don't realize is that when we're in a relationship or even like when we're with friends and they do something that irritates us or pisses us off, it's really a reflection of ourselves. And we're, we're projecting that negativity that we have in some sort of space in ourselves onto others. And people don't realize, I guess, how hurtful that is. And it's, it's, it's really funny. It seems that crazy enough, every answer that you give, everything that we give is all rooted in self-awareness. And there, there, there's no bigger <laughs> theme of that than the, the negative emotions you're experiencing, whether it's, you know, fear of abandonment, like you said, or anger or sadness. It's all really just truly a reflection of your headspace, not what your partner is doing. And I think that realization, now I haven't been in a relationship in a while, so I haven't been able to actually apply that realization, but that realization I think strengthens your relationships because you can realize that, hey, you know, my partner said this thing that irritated me, but was it really her fault or was it something that I need to deal with? And right. that realization, it means that you certainly withdraw from certain aspects of your relationship, but I think you withdraw more from the negative aspects of your relationship so that you can lean more heavily on the positives. And you can heal it too. Otherwise, if you don't, if you don't ask yourself, well, why did I feel angry? Right? Why, why? And, and then the why of the why and the why and the why, and you start peeling yourself like an onion. I mean, it took me years to realize that I was afraid of being abandoned. And it, it wasn't something that I knew from the beginning. I didn't know why I reacted the way that I did. But I certainly knew that my reactions were getting me the things that I didn't want. So I, at some point, I had to take a look and say, well, how am I an accomplice of creating the things that I hate? And, and, and that's when you start looking at yourself. And I, if you've, I don't know if you've watched The Matrix. I think The Matrix is something for, um, for, for well, my kids were watching um, Lego Batman the other day. <laughs> and, um, and, the, and then the, the Batman dude says, oh, you've never watched The Matrix. It's a, it's a movie for uh, cool millennial guys. They only get it, you know. <laughs> so, but but that's when you, that's that's that is the perfect example, right? So nobody wants to face the agents, right? The agents destroy everyone, and 
and Neo decides to face one agent, and yeah, he gets beaten down to crap, but he survives, and nobody believes that he can that he survived. And then the next time he learns something better, and the next time he and ultimately, you know, first first the agent shoots him, and he and he hits him in in the in the in the arm. But eventually, Neo can stop the bullets, and at one point, he can turn the bullets around to them. So, so those are the things that that make us angry, or or in any way hurt or, or affect us, are those bullets. And those bullets are those things that happen to us all the time. And once you once you start understanding why that hurts you, how that affects you, is that eventually they become meaningless. Because if you let's say you throughout your childhood you never felt good enough. And and everyone around you mocked you for I don't know being short, and and you know you you being short you know and and they call you names and you 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 experience that negative emotional state. Now you're in your teens and you have insecurities of being too short. So now you can't date a, a, a pretty girl or whatever, right? You might see a girl that you like and say, "No, why? I'm too short." And I, you know, nobody wants to date a short guy. Everybody likes the the jocks and the big guys. And, and 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 those are your agent's myths that you are afraid to face them. But eventually, if you understand yourself, if you know thyself, and and you and you start understanding where you fit in the world, why it is that you're the way that you are, how unique you are, that means nothing to you. That be, that that becomes pointless. It doesn't matter because then you know what it is that, that you are, not what you're not, but what you are, what it is that you have to offer. And 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 that's how you become impervious to bullets. That eventually, if I come to you and say, "Hey, man, you're so short," and 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 you've already launched the business, dated all the girls that you want, and know that your height actually might not be good for basketball, but it was great for obstacle running, and you you became a champion, right? And be like, "Yeah, I am, man," and I did a lot of cool things with it. Thanks, you know. And and, and so it's all about it's all about that that sort of mindset. It's it's. It's exposing yourself to the things that you fear and then learning how to deal with them and then getting better next time. Relatable. The short thing. It's fine. Not to make it, you know, about me, but yeah, I get it. But the, the, the bigger point here is, um, <laughs> yeah, man, anyways, that, that hits close to home. But so, yeah, when it comes to relationships, I have a real problem with um, sort of how there's like a lot of stigmas now that can be seen online. You know, there's one, oh, if men cry, not a real man. Or, and if a woman sees a man cry, they're not going to be interested in the man and all these things that, and I'm speaking on the side of men because we are men. And I feel like it would be illogical for me to speak about the perspective of a woman as I have never experienced that in my life and never will. So speaking to the side of men, and I want your opinion on this because you've probably seen, you know, how sort of some of these stigmas have changed over time, or if there weren't any before, which ones are new now. But, you know, like I said, there's ones where people say, you know, men should never cry in front of a woman or men should never be, you know, weak at all. And, you know, fair enough that I get that point. But the point I'm trying to make is being the point of being open and emotionally vulnerable when you sort of talked about openness, but if we could circle back for just a quick second and talk about vulnerability and how without vulnerability, you will not have a long lasting relationship. I know it's difficult because people say, well, in stoicism, you can't have any emotions. So when you date a stoic, it's like dating a rock. Like you just, you don't get anything out of it. I mean, you, they're never happy. They're never sad, but we know that's not true. Right? So right. when it comes to vulnerability and being emotionally vulnerable with someone, how, what are some good steps to get there? Not, with the other person, but with yourself first. Well, I think it's worth to to mention that there's a big difference between being vulnerable and being weak, right? Because something I learned from Jordan Peterson is that, and and Darwin, it's that in 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 the past when when men, so so the the innate need of a human being is to procreate. Right. And what happens is that something you might realize throughout your years is that men do the picking, but women do the choosing. So you can be like, yeah, I'll bang that girl and I'll bang that girl and I'll bang that girl and I'll definitely bang that girl. But they have to choose you. Otherwise, there's no banging. And so and so what happens is many, 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 many years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, the way to settle that is, you know, women's job are already difficult on earth. They have a monthly cycle that takes them off the charts uh, hormonally, and that hurts them in many ways. And that creates emotional havoc within them. 
you know, they, 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 they bleed for God's sake, poor things. And imagine like I bleed sometimes from here and I put a little bandaid and, and, and they have to deal with that every month. And so their job in nature is already hard enough. Then they have to carry a baby in the, in the stomach, in the, in the, in the womb for nine months. And then they have to put up with us because they when it comes to, when it comes to natural design, they're a lot, they're a lot more emotionally intelligent than we are. And they probably look at us like being like, man, why are they so stupid? <laughs> you know, why, they, why are they punching each other in the face to be with me? Why can't they just come and bring me flowers? You know what I mean? <laughs> and so, and so back, back in the day, the way for, for women to pick the best, the best specimen to continue the evolution of, of the human species was to see who was the strongest one. And that, and, and that's also in the animal kingdom. They, they, I don't know, a bunch of guys got together. They all fought each other to death. And then one survived. And, okay, that's clearly the winner. That's the one that gets picked and, and so on. And then throughout the evolution of, of humanity, that changed. And you know, I used to be, uh, you came from a good family and your parents had to sort of scout you. And, and nowadays, uh, it, it, that, that means a whole different thing. But we still hold on to those things. And like, oh, well, I have to be the toughest. I have to be the biggest. I have to be the most muscular. I have to be the richest one. Because I, we still want to stand out to be picked by women. We'll be like, oh, he's, he's worthy of having, of procreating and continuing his lineage, right? Um, but but in, in, in that's, that's also two sides of the coin. Because... How many guys, I mean, I was one, I, I was one that I had this facade of being a tough guy, this accomplished guy, I drove a cool car, I, I wore expensive clothes, but I was a disaster inside inside my own head and, and I wasn't strong. I Yeah, I, I appear strong, you can tell me whatever and I, I, I don't care, I'll beat you, I don't know, you know, whatever, I, I know three martial arts, no problem. Uh, but but I was still weak in the way of the way that I thought. I was still afraid of somebody leaving me. I mean, how ridiculous is that? But it was a fear, and and it was those fears that made that were my weak spot. So, uh, after all, life is about experiencing feelings because you you the the realest of all things is what we feel. You know, they say, yeah, this is real, this is real. But why is it real? Because I actually feel it when you touch it. Um, so somebody lying to you is very real because you feel it in, inside of yourself. And so to pry yourself from the proper emotions at the right times, it's wrong. And that is still a weakness because if a guy doesn't want to cry or he, he let, let's say, his, his, I don't know, somebody he loves passes away. Um. And he he doesn't cry because he perceives himself to be weak. He's gonna hold that inside, it, and and it's not gonna feel good, right? It's different if if you cry because your girlfriend left you. That's a, that's a whole different story. So there's there's a big difference between being weak um, and being vulnerable. And once you find your narrow path per se, then you become comfortable with all of them. I sometimes cry, uh, and my kids see me and. To me, that's okay because then they have to understand that as tough as I am, I can go on the street and beat anybody up. It doesn't matter. Um, but I, I'm also an emotional being. I, I can cry. I enjoy happiness. I enjoy all of the emotions. But obviously, in accordance with nature, or at least with what I think is is the, the proper usage of them, right? You're not going to go talk to a priest the same way you talk to a cop, the same way that you talk to your parents, right? So that's almost like, so you have to discern where to where it is that, that, that to use your emotions per se. You're not emotionless. It's just that a stoic doesn't freak out for something that doesn't require you to freak out, right? What, what's the Marcus Aurelius? He says, uh, him who suffers before it's necessary suffers more than necessary. And so, and so, but how your daughter is born and you feel the overflow of emotions, which is tears of joy. What are you going to do? Not, not gonna cry because you think it makes you weak. Then you are weak because you're not because you because you're already concerned about what somebody else thinks of you or how you're perceived versus actually being true to yourself. I think that was the best way that you could have put it was that there's a time and place. Um, that I think that's like the moderation, right? I mean, you you have these beautiful moments or these these very sad moments and feeling those emotions is totally fine. And, but then you said, you know, you don't want to go out onto the street and just be crying all the time over minor inconveniences, right? Because 
there's a time and place where you need to uphold your character and you just need to get the job done. You cannot complain. You just must, you know, persevere. But then, like you said, like beautiful moments, right? You have a child or very sad moments when you're in despair, when you lose a loved one. I, I very much agree with that statement. So I'm glad that we are seeing eye to eye. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting you mention um, your kids. I, I was kind of curious how as being a single dad, that's certainly learning a new skill set that I don't think many men have to learn until they are faced with that position. So I think it would be valuable if you could maybe speak on some of the struggles you had initially learning how to be a single dad and then the strengths that it's given you, because I would imagine you probably got more in touch with what we would consider your feminine side and becoming more emotionally intelligent. So you can then translate that information to your kids and make them a more holistic um, person, really. Yeah. Yeah, that 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 was tough. I tell you, um, because. I didn't want to go through my second divorce and, uh, and I had done everything to it mostly because somehow I knew that all of the issues could be resolved with time and patience and, and looking in the same direction. But obviously it takes two to make it work. And if one person doesn't want to, it doesn't matter what it is that you do. It's not going to work. It might work for a certain period of time until they just give up anyway. And so and what happened is that after my separation, my kids, well, for, I was homeless for a few months. And then once I got a place to live, my kids just showed up at my front doorstep and she was sort of gone. And a few weeks later, I got laid off from my job. So everything that I was or that I thought that I was got ripped in an, in an instant. I was no longer a business owner. I was no longer a, a corporate worker who made all this money and drove this nice car and had this chip on his shoulder. Um, I was no longer a husband. I no longer had a family. And now I was a mom. And, um, and so that was a, a punch in the gut because I began to realize how emotionally inept I was. I I I'm managing my emotions and the things that I thought, and I used to have breakdowns every night. I mean, I up until that point, I hadn't cried for years, and I've I've lost everything that meant to me many times. You know, I I, I got uprooted at eight years old, and uh, from then on, just moved from place to place with, with tr traumatic childhood. I mean, I I've gotten I've gotten being with barbed wired. Um, you know, you name it. And, and, but, and so I had become this super, super tough guy with nothing affecting me and nothing cool. And then all of a sudden I was breaking down every night and I was in this deep hole and something changed one time when, well, two things happened. One time I had a snap, my kids were having a snack and, uh, and I was having a breakdown in a, in a bedroom and I had told them, guys, don't play in any, right? Either eat or play. And I had wiped the floor, I don't know, five, six times a day already. And while I'm having in the middle of this, 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 this panic attack, whatever it was, I hear the milk spill all over. And when I come out of the bedroom, the dog is covering chocolate milk. The floors are covering chocolate milk. And I, I just, I just yelled, I told you not to do this. And I had my phone in my hand because I had just gotten a text message from my ex which is probably what triggered me. And I just slammed the phone on the floor. And, and at that moment, I realized what I did. And I look at my kids and they, they, their eyes were full of fear. And I realized, I, re I forgot who said this, but it's people don't remember you for how, what you did for them. It's how you made them feel. And many times we justify the way that we act because of the things that we do for others. We put up with them. We pay for everything. We clean the house all the time. We go to work, you know, whatever it is. But, but how does that make them feel? And in this point in time, I made them feel horrible. And I did not want to be that guy. I didn't, I, not because I actually had it within my power to change that. I didn't have to make them feel that way, right? I could make them feel safe. And that was my job to make them feel safe and loved and cared for. And the second thing that happened is that when 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 I go through this situation I come into my senses and and I, it probably happened to you too like you do something and then you realize what you've done and it's it's a great deal of shame that you've done such thing and I said 
I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, and I, I, I cried and I said, guys, blah, blah, blah. And they're little, man. They're, they're little kids. And, you know, my daughter came out of her chair and she hugged me and she said, daddy, it's okay. And for the first time in my life, I had the taste of empathy. And it felt so relieving. It felt like this this demon that had the the the, the hand to my neck and it was choking me because that 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 the feeling of shame and 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 it, it chokes you right. It just makes you want to die right on the spot. I mean, it feels horrible. It was lifted, and I was like, wow, it's it feels good, and 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 it feels good to make make people feel good. And from then on, I started to again back to self awareness. What are the things that I do? that make people feel a certain way and that could make them feel a different way. And I started becoming softer. I think I think becoming softer was a lot tougher than being hard, than being this guy that's unaffected by life situations. I didn't care if a comment fell on my head. I was like, whatever, you know, bring it. I, but becoming softer, becoming the person that can go to a stranger and say like, hey man, you've done such a great job. And, and and people look at you like you have three heads, but you give them a good emotional state. And even with myself, I had to learn that with myself too. I had to learn that to stop beating myself for my for my shortcomings, to stop doing what others had done. Because I, I, you know, after a while, especially if you have a hard dad or, or or a tough childhood, you learn to talk to yourself the same way that others talk to you. And and you have to unwind that because. If you don't, if you don't become good with yourself, if you don't spin in your own center, and you're not capable of bringing yourself down from anger, uh, calming yourself after a loss, or or cheering yourself on when you've done something good, then how can you possibly do it for other people? You might do it at a face level, but you don't really know what it feels like. And so, devel- developing my emotional side was was really a gift. I, I I'm I'm very very thankful for all of that hardship because. It, it 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 was just shedding this armor that I had built over the years, and 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 it was just being ripped. I mean, it was ripped to pieces, and it pulled my skin on it. But then I grew a new skin, um, and then I learned to just be a better human being with everyone around me. And 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 that just opened so many more doors. I mean, I I, I used to think that I will never smile again, and I just go anywhere and I smile, and and just people love it and and you're more welcome and you and you start realizing how often people beat themselves to to a pulp and now you see it from a different view instead of saying yeah you're a loser sure you of course you deserve that you you useless idiot and and you actually say no man it's it's okay it's temporary you know it's 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 all good you you'll, you'll get over it don't beat yourself you're 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 your own coach so if you have your own coach you have to you have to talk to yourself nicely and then you, you start experiencing emotions at a different level. And, and then it goes back to finding that balance, right? Then you start learning where each emotion goes and what you use it for and, and, and so on and so forth. Well, what you just said about, you know, the positive self-talk is directly what stoicism is about. It's about changing your thought pattern. It's about changing your perception. That That's simply all it is. And this is not a stoic quote, but this is one of my favorite quotes that I tell people all the time. And I've probably said way too many times on this podcast, so I'm going to say it again. Um, and that is that we do not see the world as it is. We see it as we are. And that's, that's one of my favorite quotes, right? If you know, if you walk around and you're negative all the time, I mean, the world's going to be a pretty terrible place. And so one, I have a lot of respect for you in the sense that, you know, you went through these, you went through these struggles as a single dad, and you made it through the end, because one thing that is not talked about enough is just men's mental health overall. That's something that's very shoved under the rug. And as men who have all had our struggles and our upbringings, I mean, some more than others, and you have more experience, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really, really tough. And I am very grateful to have you on this podcast and that you've made it this far and that you, what you're doing is impacting other people because it's very easy to have a hard upbringing and then just shed negativity out into the world continuously. And so with that, I guess I would just like to ask you, you talk about a hero mindset and I'm interested in what, what a hero mindset is and if everybody has sort of the capability to adopt and utilize like the mindset of what it means yeah it's something that i i stumbled upon on the whole experience and you know i appreciate the the comment i i don't think it's admirable in the sense that 
I didn't do what I do what I did because I'm like, oh, I'm this virtuous, amazing guy, you know, oh, a high achiever. I, I, it was not. It was because I had gone so deep into emotional hell that is, it was, it, it, it became either living there, this this insufferable life of of of, oh, I I've been divorced again. I failed my businesses. I have nothing. Everything I work for has gone down the drain. I'm 36. I have to start from scratch again. I don't have a penny in my pocket. And on top of that, I'm responsible for two kids or being like, well, what's the best that I can do? And, and um, it was almost intuitive because many times um, your body can keep going, but you can't. And, and it's, it's at that point where all of this self-talk it, it it was at that point that I had to start really taking this seriously because if you you can talk yourself to the edge of suicide, which I did, and um and and it's and it just comes down to a matter of what kind of life you want to experience, what kind of life you want to live, because I think most of the time we're all dwindling in this. A little bit of joy, a little bit of suffering. A little bit of joy, a little bit of suffering, and then we suffer as much as we as we tolerate and then we sort of work ourselves out of that right like if you get too fat and you you're suffering then well you you work out until you feel a little better right and but in this case the swing was so extreme that i had no choice to either and 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 thank you know the universe god whatever it is that people call it nowadays but whatever this greater force that it's out there and and it, and you cannot refute it because something keeps the sun at the right distance from earth so we don't get scorched or go through another ice age. And, and I had to come to terms with facing my problems and I had to come to terms with saying, well, I, I, I okay, yes, I am, I am a poor father. I mean, I, I don't have the parenting skills that I need to give my kids the life that I want, their emotional states, the confidence, the, the love, the, the magical moments. I don't, I don't have that. So I have to develop it. So am I going to run away from Mr. Smith or am I, regardless of how much it takes me, I'm going to go and, and I'm going to learn how to fight because of the lack of support for men, because not only as men, we don't have support when it comes to mental health, but also, I mean, I've been discriminated against for being a guy a lot my divorce took extremely long just because i'm a man and because they they it, it took me horrors to be able to have the custody of my children and for example i have a broken tooth and when i went to get a restraining order on, on the partner that broke my tooth by a punch i they just threw me out they were like we don't have time for this meanwhile if you even threaten a woman and they call the cops on you, you get arrested, you, you, you go through all sorts of hell because of what you've done. So, so it, it is true that it's an uphill battle. Um, and apparently men are not designed to be parents, like fathers, right? Like we're, we're, we're sort of designed to just be the, the worker bees. And, and that's why women exist because they're equipped with all of those natural skills to, to nurture a child. And so, that put me in when, when I had no support, when I had nowhere to turn to to find all of these things. It's when I dove headfirst into everything that I could get my hands on: stoicism, uh, philosophy, uh, neuroscience, practical psychology, neurolinguistic programming, mythology, you name it. And throughout those findings, it's that I stumbled upon the hero mindset and. Realize that heroes always face their their demons. They always face they they actually heroes in every single movie that you watch. They they not only they face them, but they're willing to go after them. They're like, you know what? I'm going to learn the new ninja skill. I'm gonna get the new Batmobile, whatever it is. You know, I'm gonna go train hard to do it. And and as a kid, I always wanted to be a hero. I to me that was it. I wanted to be the hero, and I did martial arts because I wanted to be like the ninjas in the movies. And I and I. Dressed in all black because I wanted to be like Batman, and um, and and here's something that happened because going through that traumatic childhood uh, instilled a lot of hate for my stepdad. And at this point, I didn't talk to him. I I didn't have a relationship with him. I think the last 
contact we had was when I was 18 and we got into a fist fight, which was the first time I ever stood up to him and ever said no to him. Because if I, if I ever said no to him, I would be punished in, in, in an extreme way. And that's how I carved my own path. I moved out, I got married, and, and then I did my own thing. But at that moment, I realized the hidden gold in all of that suffering. And it was that all of that, all of that training, per se, had already given me the skills and the mental toughness I needed to overcome what I was going through. So in, in, in short, I had gone through the typical martial arts training that the heroes go in the, in the movies, you know, that they get beaten to a pole by the master who's, who's inflexible, but they come out so much stronger and then they can finally defeat the, 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 the monster or the, the evil guy or whoever. So when I realized that, two things happened. First, I gained, I had a newfound sense of appreciation for my dad. So I called him and I say, hey, man, I know I've punished you my whole life for the things that you've done to me. But I also, but now I want to congratulate you for them too, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be who I am. And if it wasn't for those things, I wouldn't be as strong as I am now and probably wouldn't be able to face the situation that I have in my hands. And, and I realized why he had done it. He had not done it with evil intent. He did it because he, he always told me men are made by beatings, you know, by, by, by hardship. And so he sort of tried to fast track the hardships on me so I will become tougher. And he did. So that healed that relationship with him. Uh, actually, we're like best friends now and we talk often. And um, he sometimes he calls me for advice, which I think is funny. Um, but, but the other thing that allowed me to see is that being a hero, it's not putting in a cape or a mask and saving kitties from a tree or or helping the old lady cross the street. Yeah, sure, that's that's part of it. But being a hero is being able to face bigger things than other people are equipped to handle. And then teaching them how to do it. Teaching them how not to get to the point of, of taking your life or the point of divorce or the point of, I don't know, quitting whatever you're about to do because there's a better way. And unfortunately, I had to learn by stumbling and fumbling and banging my head on the wall to, to find the right path. But after, but after I did, I'd say, man, the best thing that I can do for people is to teach them how to avoid these problems or if they're going through them to overcome them. So uh, in my darkest moment, it, it, this, the, there was this night where, where my ego and, and my, my negative talk had beaten me down to a pulp and I had my, my kids were, uh, struggling in a way. I had no money. Uh, I was gonna have no place to live anymore. I was about to. I was. I was about to lose my place. I had applied to. I don't even know how many jobs, but more than a hundred, and and which is unbelievable to me because I used to get a job anytime I wanted. And it came to this point where I said, "Well, maybe I am like an outcast. Maybe I am the the rock in the cogs. Maybe maybe." All of these things are just a clear signal that I'm not supposed to be around. You know, maybe I am causing my children unnecessary suffering by not being good enough of a dad, not making money to pay for their bills. My, my ex was torturing me because of the divorce and blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, maybe, and I had a life insurance policy. So I said, if I take my life, my kids get a million dollars, my ex can buy a house, take care of them for a couple of years, and then maybe they'll figure it out. And I'll stop suffering because at that point, Dev seem more like a relief than than a scary thing i i actually rather faced the complete unknown the complete not knowing of what happens after you 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 leave this earth than to continue suffering at that level and so so it was almost like a pragmatic thing it was it wasn't it it, it wasn't like like oh, no it it, it 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 was a well thought out thing i i, I really had to to talk to myself and, and look at the pros and look at the cons and, and contemplate what I was doing, see if if someone was gonna miss me. So, and, and it didn't it didn't appear to me that I was gonna be the case. So that night that I that I decided to do it, I, I remember clearly coming out of the bedroom after an argument with with my fiance, and and she told me that she was moving out. So that to me was just the straw that broke the camel's back because now my kids. Had been with her for a couple of years. They called her mom. They they had already developed a relationship because my ex wasn't present. She was, she's 
she was just not around. And here I was, I was failing again at, at, at the thing, the only thing that I ever wanted, which it, which, you know, I said for the first time at the beginning of the podcast, which was finding that relationship, that, that, that home, I had fell again. And he, here I was going again to hurt my kids and I couldn't allow myself to do that. So I said, fine, then this is what it is. And I went and I sat on the couch before I, before I did what I was going to do. And I started sobbing, asking for forgiveness to my kids because I obviously they were going to be hurt in a way, but maybe they were young enough that they didn't understand it or, and, and they might be in care of my, my, my wife or my, my ex-wife or whatever. And in that moment, I had a flash of insight. And in that moment, some, an experience that I can't explain happened, but in, 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 in a blink of an eye, I, my, my life flashed before my eyes. I, I understood a lot of different things. And, and among those, why it was that I went through all of these hardships, all of these, these, these tough situations. And I realized that it was because I was ignorant because I didn't have someone to hold my hand, somebody to teach me not to go into the forest there because there's a bear on this side and it's going to shred you to pieces. And once you heal from that, you're going to try to go the other way and there's a lion. Nobody told me that. I had to find on my own. And I, I was scared, man. I said, man, I don't want to keep going into the forest anymore because God knows what's next. And more than money, the best thing that I could do for my kids was to leave them my maps of experiences, my map of saying, hey, these are the, the, the biggest ha-ha moments that I've had in my life. These are the hardest earned lessons. These are the things that you should know if you are to move forward, right? And, um, and that was a lot more valuable than money. So at that, in, in, in that moment, I knew that I had to write a book, even though I was not a writer. I mean, I mean English is my second language. And so that's what started the whole journey. And that's how I, I, I assumed and, and accepted that perhaps the hero mindset is real and that not only I should face these things, but I should put a smile on my face because I, I have the tools and I, and I can go and do it and I can do it for others because my I, I, I clearly I didn't value my life enough until that point. So now I started living for somebody else. And that changed my life. That changed my life because when, once I surrendered, once I lost everything, w- once I gave up the dichotomy of control, of the things that how I thought they needed to be, what I thought I needed to do, or, or how I thought life had to be, it's when I actually found it all. It's when I actually found the purpose that I had sought for all of my life. When I when I saw the 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 one mission that I had to accomplish no matter what, which I, I have been on for now three years and it's not been easy. It, it's actually probably the hardest thing I've done so far, but man, I wouldn't change it for anything. And Finally, I beat Mr. Smith. I, I saw how I was the, the, the guilty person for all of my results. And that's what changed my perspective on my relationship. And my relationship just 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 skyrocketed with, with my fiance, with my kids, with my neighbors. With, and, and then I, and I started writing the book, No Grail Without Drivers, which took me almost two years to do without a penny. So I had to learn to write. And I wrote it and I edited it. I think I wrote it six times. I edited four times. I had to learn how to edit because I couldn't pay an editor. And um, all driven by this this purpose that had found me, right? Because I don't like to say I found it because I don't think I found the purpose. The purpose found me on my darkest hour. And that's how we got here. That, that's, that's, that's quite an amazing story. And I, I think it's kind of like life's foundational question, which is why am I here? And to me, it sounds like when you kind of strip away all your possessions, you strip away everything that you think gives you status and you're sitting in your situation, you're sitting on that couch, you're faced with the question, why am I here? I think speaking from our experience, life is so much better when, like you said, you are living for other people rather than just living for yourself. I think that's something where you're never going to lose sight of that. Whereas if you're living for yourself, you can kind of lose sight of that. We've both only had our personal experiences with that. And it's really interesting um, we were talking about this before we started recording a hero with a thousand faces and the hero's journey. And it, it, it's, it's ironic how closely your journey mirrors a lot of those steps. You know, it, I believe that Campbell calls it the road of trials is one of the, one of the stages in, in the hero's journey. And it sounds like that road of trials is exactly what you were on. You were in that very dark place that I think a lot of people we consider to be heroes have to go through because you need that insight and you need that kind of just valuable experience, whether it's a spiritual awakening, or I believe it's called atonement or something like that, where 
everything just makes sense now. You are here for a reason. And the people who have these nice, cushy lives, I think, are missing that crucial aspect, which, you know, obviously we don't all want to go through a point where we're at a point where we don't know what we're doing with our lives and we're very in a dark place, but the heroes are the ones who make something of it. And it's very impressive to see that you have gone from that state to somewhere where you are passing down what you call your mental map and creating really a legacy to leave behind in terms of, you know, I've been through all of these shitty situations. I got through it. Here's my lessons. That's one of the most valuable things I think you can partake in life. And so it's just something that I think we're both very impressed by. And it's kind of ironic as I've just started reading a hero with a thousand faces, how closely it mirrors that journey. Yeah, I think it's interesting and it's and it's hard to believe because I think what took me the longest is to come to terms that that actually had happened to me. Um, because my up until that moment, I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in the universe. I, I thought that everything was just a result of physics. And and if there was a God, then, well, I needed to find and punch him because how come that I had gone through all these things? So I had a very misanthropic view of life. and just to experience that undeniable thing it, it's it's how can i turn away now right how how knowing what i know how and, and you know it at an atomic level it's not it's, there's a difference between knowing and understanding right and so so knowing what i knew i couldn't i couldn't turn away and 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 i still can't turn away and and it's been times where i've had to make tough choices where i say well i, I am i going to continue on this path or am i going to succumb to this or i don't and, and you know what when i when i held on to the path and i say well that's faith it's like knowing it faith is it's not not something you do because people think that faith is believing in what you can't see but in the sense of doing it like no i believe this will happen i believe like you're doing it in that sense but in this case it's a knowing in what you can't see right it's it's, it's a different thing and and then when once i stumble upon upon campbell's book and it, it explained it as a real thing. It was this huge validation to me that that wow, I'm like it's it's real, right? It's it's a real thing. It to me, I mean, I'm still impressed by. I swear to you, I'm still I'm still speechless about the fact that it's it's a real thing. And when when you look at it, and you're like, wow, it, it's true. <laughs> and, but but you're right. And everyone goes through their own through their own cycles. Um, I think that 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 this this sort of archetype per se, because I also started believing it, believing in my experience from many different points of view. I consulted with a psychiatrist and just to see if I hadn't had a psychotic breakdown, and and she said, "Well, no. What you what you what you've explained it, in my religion, we call it a, a spiritual awakening." And to me, I was like, "Huh, maybe it is real." And then I heard Jordan Peterson talk about it from the psychological standpoint and the archetypes and. And and I was like, wow, okay, so it's a, it's, and, and a, a, you know, it's the Stoics talk about it, and and then uh, religions talk about it, and all of a sudden, they all connected. They I realized they all talked about the same thing, and and that gave me a lot of confidence in in myself and my experience to keep going forward because then not only I wasn't going crazy, but I had been gifted this 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 gift of of first of all knowing that. Everything is perfect at all times. Everything, it, it has been, it's now, and it's going to be perfect at all times. It doesn't matter. You know, your interpretation of things, sure, might might make you think otherwise, but it's all perfect. And it's just something that can be explained better than that because I can't. Um, and the second is I say, well, the, the, this, this gift of having gone through all those things and now being able to share it with other people. Because another thing that I have is that I hate to see people suffer. I mean, I suffer along with them. And so to, to have the tools to say, hey, don't do this, you know, don't do this because you're going to hurt. And somebody says, okay, fine, I'm not going to do it. You're like, that makes sense. you know, <laughs> it's one person that suffers less. Um, so, so yeah, I, again, I, I don't, I don't consider myself anything special. I, 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 I lucky for sure. I think, and, 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 and been given this gift for sure. But I, as far as special, I'm as regular as it can be. I didn't go to college. I, you know, English is my second language, and, and so I'm, I think I'm just as regular as everybody else. <laughs> well, you said a few things that really stood out to me, and one is, you know, you were like, "Well, I had to learn the messy way." There really is no other way to learn. You know, if you don't, I mean, someone can tell you something, but if you don't actually go through, and now your example, right, we get, we get pretty serious here, but even on a basic surface level, 
you know, lesson that you have to learn. You have to fail. You have to get your hands dirty a little bit in order to learn how to clean them, right? And then what you said as well is very relatable to Ren and I, and we've had a friendship, you know, that goes back years, is that there was the place where we found sort of our purpose was at rock bottom. And this is something I feel is almost very necessary. And this is, I'm not sure where this would go in the hero's journey, um, but I'd probably at like the sort of enlightenment, that, that point where you sort of had the realization, right, is at the lowest point where you feel like you cannot go any lower. You know, if you know what Minecraft is, bedrock, you literally cannot dig lower than the rock, right? You cannot get lower. You are at the bottom. There is nothing else. And this is what's interesting to me. As you said, you had a vision, like you had a moment. And this relates to what Marcus Aurelius says, basically, and this is sort of a paraphrasing, but everything you need is already within you. Yeah. It it wasn't, it wasn't someone else. It wasn't, you know, a friend who gave you a piece of advice to click. It was already within you, but through, you know, the trials and the tribulations, you had to find it. And that's that's where that's how Ren and I really came to our friendship as well. And really starting the podcast was everything that we needed, we already had. And through our shared experiences and through our you know difficulties that we've had, we were able to connect. And so now that we have the ability to connect with you and other people and say, look, you don't need an online course to teach you how to be great. You don't need, you know, a therapist to tell you how to feel. What you need to do is deeply understand yourself in order to move forward, because if you aren't at an adequate sense of understanding with who you are, you'll never be able to be the person you were destined to be. You'll never be able to be the hero that people need. And that's the thing, too. You said, you know, we, we have all watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Batman, you know, right? And it's, it's super inspiring. But what a movie cannot cover, you know, you see a character who looks sad, but you can never truly understand what that's like to be at rock bottom unless you're there yourself. That's sort of the one thing that the movies don't cover. But it is inspiring. And we sort of, as a kid, we have all this inspiration to go and conquer the world and be great. And as our as we kind of grow up, we sort of lose that spark. And we're like, oh, nine to five, go home, go to, you know, whatever. And it gets sort of boring. It gets very stagnant. So that fire that we have is youth. That's why it's so important to spread your story and our message to our generation is because we are still at that age where we are still young. We are still youth. We are still youthful. We can still ignite that spark and make change and share this message and inspire people. And so your story to me is truly incredible because you are still out here sharing your message and sharing your lessons and saying, look, I'm 36, right? Correct. No, I'm 40 now. 40. <laughs> hey, look, it does, look, you look 36, man. All right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and you say, look, I have gone through over double what you kids have gone through. I have, twice the life experience. And yet these messages are all simple and they're still relatable. And you're trying to teach the youth. Like you said at the beginning of the podcast, there's no such thing as happiness if it's not shared. And I would say the same thing about wisdom. There's no such thing as knowledge if you can't share with other people and if it can't be a universal truth that we learn. So I just want to say your story is very inspiring and I've it's very relatable in certain aspects and I've enjoyed hearing it very, very much. Thanks. No, thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Thanks. And you know, it took me a couple of years to come around and share it, but it's almost like finding this this treasure and then not wanting to tell anyone about it, right? And and I didn't want to tell anyone about it because of my own misconceptions. My own. It, it took me a while to go from that that point of 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 hating existence to to witnessing something that I couldn't explain and then having to change. Every how I saw the world afterwards. It, that I think in, in in Jungian psychology is called integration, and and that's 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 that was probably the the hardest part. But but yeah, and and I think you guys are doing such an amazing and heroic job at, at doing what you're doing because, um, see, I'm 40, so I'm not old, but I see the older people who who messed up things for everyone based on on greed and based on on how they thought things needed to be based on ignorance mostly because of the things that they don't know and and what i came to realize is that the golden rule is golden for a reason because you rent said this it's, it's it feels good to live for other people you know and some might say might say oh that's stupid or that you're never gonna get anywhere or or you're not gonna achieve anything or that's cliche or you're not jesus or whatever but 
the truth is, how do you feel, right? Like, how do you feel when you do something for somebody else? How do you feel when you yelled? How do you feel when you open the door for somebody? And you guys in your generation have this gift that if you start realizing that we're all different puzzle, pieces of the puzzle of, 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 a, of a massive one. We, each one is different. One guy is great at fighting. One guy is great at cooking. One guy is great at basketball. And, and, and yeah, you can enjoy all of them at the same time, but you're great at one. And, and you, you fulfill this and, and giving to others and, and doing things for others. Also, you're doing it for yourself and you're, you're growing and you're learning to, to connect better. That's why you're also going to be successful in dating because once, once you grasp that and the other person understands that, then the sky is the limit because now you shamelessly love. You give your all to the other person and the other person gives their all to you. And what can come out of that? Nothing but good. Nothing but good. Right? Like you don't have, you're not in the defensive. You're not waiting to get backstabbed. You're not waiting to, 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 for the other person to put their personal interest before yours because you have this mutual understanding that it's all in. And once you're all in, you are not two people. You're actually, you become one. You, 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 and, and same with, with other human beings. You, you mer it's almost like you're merging with the other person at a, at a different level and now you're becoming a stronger force instead of two separate strong forces. That's, yeah, that's exactly what we, we talked about. In the, in the few kind of episodes we've done on relationships, that's exactly what the end goal is, right? Is one merged person who you have a shared purpose, you have a shared goal, and you're marching forward to it. And I think that's that's ultimately the goal. And I think I think if I could boil it down in terms of if I had to give a simple explanation for why living for others is better, if you don't know how to care for others, how are you going to care for yourself, right? Because when you walk down the street and you're caring for others, you're going to run into six different people at six different situations who need six different things. And similarly within yourself, as you go throughout your day, your your needs are going to change. So if you can't address the needs of others and at least acknowledge them and see what they are and care for them, you're not going to be able to do the same within yourself. And that, that's something that was a realization. I, I think I was I was very selfish as a teenager. And I think the more that I kind of get into philosophy overall and enjoy this podcast, enjoy this platform and meeting people, you know, obviously with incredible stories is that that selfishness it sucks you know even like having your self interest in mind it seems counterintuitive if i always have my self interest in mind you'd think i would feel better cuz my life would be better that's not how it works if you're self interested 100% of the time people around you are going to hate you and <laughs> you've said it a lot you're going to end up hating you <laughs> if if that's your self interest 100% of the time that's that's my kind of simplistic way of boiling it down and i and i think that's why you know, relationships are so important and it's, it's really cool to see how you've tied hero mindset and your teachings into relationships and your experience with that is that those relationships, whether it's romantic or even friends, those are kind of what fuel you. Those are what give you, I think, your fire when, you know, you're not motivated on a certain day or you're not taking care of yourself the way you should a certain day. That's what gives you that fire and every, everything combining to just that one overall purpose, that one overall goal, which certainly it seems like you found and are executing well on now. I'm trying, I'm trying. And it's true though, that they, the hero, the hero thing, again, it's, it's, it really is like a push in the back. My, 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 my son likes to get up at night and go knock on my door, right? <laughs> in the middle of the night. And so I, when I open the door, he's just standing there and I have to walk him back into his bed and just goes back to sleep right away. And I go, at the beginning, I used to huff and puff. And like, why is he getting up? Why can I never have a, a night of sleep? It's been three years. I can't sleep, blah, 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 but it's not necessary. And one time I said, buddy, listen, you don't need to come here and, and, and wake me up every night. You know, just stay in your bed. And then I said, man, that's not what a hero does. A hero will be happy, happy that the, the kid comes and, and searches for him and say, hey, you know, he didn't say it to me, but he's like, hey, dad, I'm scared. I need to go back to bed. Can you go with me? And so, so when you take the hero mindset, you're like, well, a hero will be happy to do this. And, and that, that doesn't just change the outcome of your actions, but at least in my case, it makes me feel so much better about myself. It just, it just gives me, it gets rid of all the things that I want to avoid. I want to avoid guilt. I want to avoid knowing that I could have done better and I didn't. I, I, I want to avoid not, not reciprocating, you know? And so to me, that's just, that that to me solved a lot of problems. Just having the hero mindset, and not even 
let, let's not even attach it to Campbell. Let's attach it to um, let's, what cartoon my kids like to watch. My Hero Academia. I don't know if you've watched it. It's an anime. It's an anime about about like some kid that it's an anime, like the typical story. But and and so the the, the number one hero, he he's tough as hell. The guy is like he's, he's he's he looks angry, but he's smiling. And every time something happens, he just smiles and he was like ha oh, ha ha ha, right? And I say, dude, that is genius because if everything, every time something that you don't expect happens to you, you go like, ha, 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 fine, I'll take care of it. There's no problem. That made me feel like a million dollars. I mean, j- even just thinking about smiling on a challenge made me feel like I got this. I, I, th- th- and not only do I have this, but I'm going to give it my best and I'm going to feel good about it. And, and it just boils down to the way that you feel, right? And, and, and I feel good and challenges become more more fun per se and um and it doesn't again doesn't have to do anything to with it doesn't have to do anything with a hero to be a hero but it's just to to think about it from that point of view of the, of the hero that he always wants to go slay that dragon he's eager to go to the next mission he's eager to go do the next thing that that changes the way that you feel with yourself and if you feel good with yourself then that becomes ripples in the pond through other people around you. If you get a text message in the morning and says, hey, Ren, you got fired this morning. And you're like, oh, fuck, man. And then you just get up. And you're like, oh, you just want to make it. Oh, I can't believe it. What am I going to pay for my phone? And you go outside. And, and then somebody it's in front of you. You like, say, come on, move, you asshole. Rah, rah, rah. And, and then somebody says hi to you. you be like, fuck you. I don't want to talk to you. And, 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 and your whole – and what happens is that what you're thinking is affecting your actual real life. And by the end of the day, you're like, oh, man, when it rains, it pours. I crash my car. My friend told me to go F myself, blah, blah, blah. And if you say, hey, Ren, you got a, a race. Now you're like, great. And you go, I say, hey, hi, you know, Miss Gladys. And, and you yell to the person in front of you. And then you get coffee for your friends. And that changes the results. But if you learn to control that within yourself, regardless of what happens, whether you get fired or not, because you can get fired and be like, oh, great. You know, I was feeling kind of stuck in this job. So now I got some room to breathe. I, I can assess my life. Yeah, maybe I'll have some challenges. No problem. We'll deal with them when they come. But I'll, this is a blessing. Let's move forward. You know, I'll put the smile on my face and boom, go. And you change your life that way. Just simply by, by I think you will say a lot, a lot, Mateo, is how you perceive the world. You perceive it and you have a choice. You can choose how to perceive it. You don't have to perceive it the way other people taught you to. That losing a job is bad. That your partner leaving is negative. It, you can actually change the meaning of things if you just are willing to actually wrestle with your ego a little bit, right? Well, that's sort of the interesting thing about Stoicism is when it was first being taught, it was it was really only taught to a handful of people, right? It, it was very it was very small, very small school. But then what they did is they the they sent they sent out and they were like, oh, guess what I learned? Like you should look at this, look at this, and it was community. That's right. that's what Stoicism is about. It's about strengthening your community. And now Ren Ren said. Um, you know, if you can never care for people, you'll never be able to really care about yourself as well. And I think it goes the other way around. You know, if you have a very negative relationship with yourself, you're going to project that onto other people. And it, like you said, it's going to make people feel bad. You're going to have that ripple effect, the domino effect, whatever. And it's really going right. to negatively affect the community you have around you. So as much as a strong leader or a strong person is going to care about others, they are also going to be in a very good place with themselves so that they can do that. And it goes both ways. There's there's a balance. And so I guess if I had one last one question for you, it's you would have one piece of advice regarding the best way to make amends within yourself. And if you had that one piece of advice to give to our generation on how to make amends for yourself and why it's beneficial, what is that piece of advice? Um, I will have to, dissect your 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 what you mean by making amends with yourself you mean you hold grudges within yourself do you mean do you think that you have done something wrong and you don't you don't forgive yourself for it what do you mean exactly sure i'll specify so like you were saying right when you had the moment of realization you were like everything i have is already within me and so how when when i say make amends you make the changes not with uh, what's around you, but within yourself to be a better individual, right? Like managing your emotions or 
what are, what are some really great ways uh, to go about that? What is the best way to start from the inside out? Well, I, w- I will have to start by saying that we exist in three planes. And, 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 and this is literal. You exist in the physical plane, which is this. Then you exist in the mental plane, which is the things that you think. And then you exist in the spiritual or emotional plane, which is what you feel. And each one of those planes requires maintenance for them to be aligned. So you can think good things all the time and you might not stress, but if you don't take care of your body, your body will decay faster. Maybe you go to the gym and get ripped, but if you don't take care of the things that you feel, or then you will might look great, but you might feel horrible. And same goes with the things that you think. Um, so in a way, the easiest way to, to, to make, to, to be your best friend or to come to terms with your past or the things that you've done that maybe you're not so proud of or uh, things that have happened to you that didn't make you feel so good. It's to always realize that everything has two sides. Everything has two sides. There's there's the male and the female, the positive, the negative. There's light and there's blackness. There's up, there's down. Uh, everything has two sides. So sometimes we focus on only one side and you have to learn to find the other side to things. As much as there's a negative side to that delicious meal you're eating, there's also a positive side to you being cheated on. And so it takes a little bit of work to find it. But once you find it, is that you can come full circle and begin to understand why certain things happen or why it is that you did certain things and how you can learn from them. And that's how you grow. You 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 start becoming a, a whole person if you're learning from your experiences instead of beating yourself over them. Uh, because there are things that already happened. And so why continue on a negative path or why continue to beat yourself down or not forgive yourself for something when it's something that already happened that's it, it, it's it's it was a moment in time and it's gone but you can gain a lot of valuable knowledge from it that you can use moving forward in your life and and eventually find that that the, the heavenly state that i think we all pursue we all want to be feeling good all the time and feel that everything is okay and we have a purpose and we have a loving partner but you can get there if you don't reap those golden nuggets of wisdom from all of the experiences that you've had, you know, from your life. And then you have to do that in the three planes, right? In the emotional, in the physical, and in the mental. Awesome. And uh, I'll I'll wrap up with one final question. You challenged us to give you a difficult question. So I thought that was it. I'll I'll oblige you. We'll go with two. If you could go, (laughs) we talked about, we talked about relationships a lot today. If you could go back and give 16-year-old you a piece of advice in terms of how to be more successful in your relationships, what would it be? 16-year-old me? <laughs> 16, 17, 18, yo- younger you. Our age, younger our, you. Age, our age. I will say do the right thing. Do the right thing because it's not only the right thing to do, but by doing the right thing you nobody can steal the treasure of peace from your heart because you are going to make mistakes that's that's granted i mean it's it's just it's just inevitable but as long as you do the right thing all of the time then you you're not leaving your failures up to you if you fail, then it was meant to be. You're not causing it yourself. So, so, so in a way, I will say just do the right thing because it's your insurance policy to to for peace of mind. Because if somebody, you know, people do things. They don't do them to you. They just do things. They they and and if you if you can understand that, then relationships become a lot easier. Because instead of thinking that your partner is yelling at you, insulting at you. You're just realizing that they're just doing that and it's probably based on how they feel inside. And that can make the whole difference between becoming their enemy or becoming their friend and being like, hey, you know what? 
I see that you're not being your usual self. What's the matter? What's bothering you? And and you actually have a real chance of developing a real relationship instead of this tug and pull of, well, if you give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. And if not, then I'll give you the opposite. Awesome. Well, Victor, thank you for having a really engaging conversation with us today. I, I think both of us can say that we learned a lot from you. Um, we encourage our listeners to go check out your book, No Grail Without Dragons, available on Amazon. For more of your personal insights, um, obviously a very wise man, and we've learned a lot and hope our audience learns a lot. So thank you for joining us today. Um, we're really grateful to have you on. Yeah, th- no, thank you. I'm I'm humbled that you let me talk this much. And, and I would like to do something for you. It's not a big gesture, but if any of your listeners want my book, I will send you a link and they can download it for free. That way that way they can save themselves a bunch of pain and also some, some money. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Mateo. And thanks, Ren. So for the rest of you, if you've made it this far, um, we are, this is our new season three. This is the third season of the Gen Z Stoic. And like we said, we are putting a lot more emphasis on outreach and meeting more people like Victor, more guests, more perspective. Uh, Again, we are also on Rumble as well, if you have not checked out our Rumble thus far. And in terms of our next coming episodes, we're very excited to see what this brings. And we would love if you gave us a bit of feedback about what you thought about this episode. And like Victor said, if you haven't checked out his book, we will be providing you a link so you can download it for free and save yourself some pain. So with that being said, this is season three of the Gen Z Stoic podcast, and we will see you guys next week.